Welcome back to House Build TV. This evening, we're going to discuss part E, resistance to sound. And I'd like to welcome back Jeff Wilkinson from Wilkinson Construction and Owen Ryan from housebuild.co.uk. Thanks a million for joining us again, Jeff. Let's get started. So um, in today's podcast, uh, we're going to be talking about uh, approved uh, document E. Um, now, this is to do with the uh, resistance of sound uh, between parts of a building and adjoining buildings. So it's particularly relevant to the party wall design, uh, separating walls within flats, for example, uh, floors within flats. Um, and also there's a section in there that uh, deals with the acoustic conditions in schools. Now, obviously, as we're primarily focused on uh, house building in uh, these broadcasts, uh, we won't be dealing with, with E4, which, which deals with schools. Uh, but if anyone is interested in that, um, by all means, um, uh, get in touch and we'll see what we can do uh, for that. So uh, where shall we start? Um, Probably the, the most important um, part of understanding um, the requirements themselves are to look at what's actually trying to be achieved uh, by the introduction of, of this regulation. Um, what we'll often get is um, people who are living in flats or in houses complaining about uh, the noise that's being generated from the adjoining property, whether it's their neighbours upstairs or uh, below or adjacent um, and the idea of the regulation essentially is to to reduce down the disturbance that you'll get um, by what's going on in, in your neighbor's property and to a slightly lesser degree uh, between uh, habitable rooms and, and what we call sort of your main living conditions um, so for example between the floor between a bedroom say and, and, and the main living room so that's what we're looking to, to try and achieve. And uh, within the uh, regulation itself, uh, there are a whole series of really useful diagrams that set out different wall types and how you can use those different wall types um, to manage and achieve the sound reduction levels uh, between. So depending upon whether you're looking at um, a, a masonry wall, or you're looking at a lightweight, say, timber frame wall. Um, actually, it's probably a good place to, to start, that when we're looking at um, reduction of noise, um, th there's a couple of ways in which um, noise can transfer uh, between one part of the property uh, and another. So you can get sound transmission um, physically through the structure itself. So if you imagine a floor for the moment and you sort of, uh, imagine that your neighbor upstairs is, is dancing about on the floor um, as they're actually hitting the floor itself and it's vi you're getting those vibrations down through the, the floor structure itself. Um, you're looking to kind of reduce that down uh, by uh, breaking that up with, with a separating layer. Um, but you can also get airborne sound uh, as well. So you can get noise transfer through through the air effectively. Um, uh, transferring from, from one property to another. So what the regulations do is they try to look at both that impact sound, so the direct sound transfer and the indirect uh, sound transfer. But what it's not doing, and I think that's perhaps uh, reasonably important to point out at this, this stage, is it's not dealing with um, a noisy party uh, in a garden three doors away kind of thing. It's, it's not intended uh, to do any of those things because that's, that's going beyond the uh, construction and the, the boundaries themselves. But sometimes there may be a planning condition uh, that relates back to that. So if, for example, your property faces onto a railway or onto a noisy motorway, then there may be additional requirements uh, that are introduced through your planning consent to, to deal with those. So just be aware of the fact that sometimes the sound reduction measures that you may be asked to put in can go beyond what you see within the approved document. So that that might, for example, prevent the use of an opening window on one of those elevations. So you'd have to install a mechanical ventilation system to the property to avoid the 
the noise that you would get through through the opening window and you'd end up with a particularly high performing acoustic window in, in those cases jeff yeah. um, masonry walls uh you're well in ireland i'm not sure i'm sure it's probably the same in the uk you can't do back-to-back -back chasing of certain depths yes so what once you what would it that's a very good point so um what we can do is we can um if if anyone goes to the proof document itself you'll see the typical kind of examples of the separating walls separating floors but i think perhaps for for today's podcast it's perhaps more important actually to to come on to some of the defects that you're likely to find yeah. some issues uh that, that we we get on a regular basis and certainly one of them can be something as simple as uh back-to-back -back chasing in the wall so if you end if you've got a solid masonry wall you can end up with chasing out the uh electrics on one side of the wall and chasing out the electrics on the other side of the wall and effectively you reduce down the thickness of the the wall now unless you're going physically from one property to the next property mm -hmm. and actually making a am i in the room that faces the room that's in it? it's actually quite difficult um to to spot those kind of issues um when you're you're, you're moving between one and two it's a lot easier if it's on the plan because you can see it on the plan you can see it on the drawing that someone's designed it that way but quite often what will end up happening is that the homeowner will turn around to the uh contractor and go you know what we could do with a couple of extra sockets over there uh, and then they'll go, yeah, that's fine. What we do is we'll get a couple of extra uh, sockets in there without really thinking about what is, is this a situation where perhaps you're getting this back to back situation. You reduce down the, the wall itself. Uh, the same thing can happen on like a, a cavity wall uh, where you've got um, uh, timber, two, two layers of timber frame um, mm -hmm. and you can end up with a situation there where again you're weakening the the sound resistance because any holes that you're making within that uh, cavity uh, wall makeup are creating potential paths to allow sound uh, to to permeate through so you always want to be wary of those um, yeah, so generally you have a top hat detail on those cavity walls so you build your services outside of it and like you know more than with uh, thermal bridging anything which provide the path to go through it's the same theory with sound and with ventilation provide the path to go through one and probably to the next that gives rise to issues so that's why ventilation sound and heat are all of great concern when you're designing buildings yeah and as i say some sometimes people um start off thinking that what they're going to do is they're going to have effectively a cavity wall um, but then end up with virtually ending up with a solid masonry wall by ending up connecting the two walls together wrongly. Yeah. Um, so you can end up, depending on how you do it, if it's a truly separating wall in two leaves, then you need to make sure that say, if, if you're trying to tie between the two leaves, yeah. the ties themselves don't create the path for sound to transfer from one leaf across to the, across to the other. Um, so that, that, those are some good examples um, of um, some issues that, that you may get. Likewise, uh, when you're dealing with the separating floor, uh, what you will normally find is there's normally a, an introduction of what's referred to as a resilient layer. So it, it takes, it's like a sound deadening section of, of the top floor. Now, one of the common mistakes with that is to um, put the skirting board down um, and have that tightly connected to the, uh, the, the the top floor layer itself, which then creates again this sound path uh, through from one part of the property uh, to the other. Um, other things that people often forget um, or come along and, and do, uh, sometimes they'll um, decide oh, what we'll do is we'll get a speaker in the floor or we'll, um, we'll, we'll put some extra down lighters in or, because quite often we get called back and go, Oh, well, we've got noise from the, the property above, property below. Um, what, what's the cause of this? And when you actually look into it, what's happened is the homeowners actually come in and made some changes to it. So uh, the carpets and stuff have gone and they've, they've put some lovely laminate flooring down on top of um, the original and then jammed it tightly in underneath the uh, skirting boards. And lo and behold, they've, they've got issues or they've um, put something in the ceiling of the property um, and uh, again, they've broken down the, the, those individual layers. Um, 
one of the things um, about party is that it does have a series of um, standard details so there are a certain things that you can use and providing you follow those standard details um, then effectively you don't necessarily have to to undertake testing um, we would generally speaking recommend that you do undertake actual sound tests on the properties to make sure that you've um, got the necessary because that way you can evidence for fact it's actually going to achieve what it needs to achieve on the day that you've left it yeah, no, we in, our, in Ireland you have it's a legal requirement to do sound tests for a certain amount of house types and for a certain amount of apartments or whatever in a block. Um, and I'm glad to, to let people know on housebuild.co.uk we have all, in our download center and under regulations all those details from Part D, which will help you in designing to stop the transmission of sound. Mm -hmm. There's also um, a website uh, known as Robust Details. Um, which contains a whole series of um, really good guides to how to uh, design uh, walls and floors that are unlike issues with uh, sound. Very good. I think we have a lot of them on houseful.co.uk. <laughs> always get the plug in. Always get the plug in. Absolutely. So, um, and like, do you, is there a legal requirement for testing in the UK? So, so that effectively there's a requirement for a number of tests per number of houses but it does depend in part on whether you've used the robust details in the first instance and then in addition to that um how many replicates there are of yeah. the the same detail so if each one is new and unique we would really be expecting you to have tested uh, each and every one of those um if you are um effectively doing lots of the the same uh, type of construction then at that point you can test um, a, a, a percentage number um, one of the things that does my head in is that uh, what it actually says within that is that in the event that you get some failures you then need to test the the full number yeah. um, I can't remember the last time anyone actually submitted a set of test results to us that actually showed that they had some failures. Uh, it's it's almost as though what they'll do is they'll test as many as they need to to get the number of past tests um, and send that information through and possibly not tell you about the failed ones because that would then mean that they'd have to test more of them. Uh, that's very cynical on my part, I know, but uh, it, it does make me wonder because surely there must be some of these that fail. Yeah, but that, some, Jeff, never, it doesn't happen out there. It doesn't happen out there. Uh, never no. a sound transmission. <laughs> They're no. all perfect first time, every time. If, for example, um, you purchase a property and you find that the noise, I don't know if it's, a, if it's a requirement for when you purchase properties now. If you find that the noise is, uh, cancellation is not sufficient, is it something that they can retrofit and fix or is it a costly upgrade? So, Ideally, what you want to do is you want to, the first thing to remember is that um, for a lot of people, their, their view on what a noise level is mm -hmm. can be very, very different and what the tolerance ratings are between them. Um, when you're actually selling the property on, you re, this is why I really strongly recommend that people get the test done in the, in the first instance, because if, if, if it's a situation where they haven't had it tested, it's very difficult for them to prove afterwards that the work that they handed over that was bull um, did actually comply. Um, so if you um, go down and let's say this is one of the properties that didn't actually have a test on it and you subsequently find that it's then tested and it fails, um, then it is quite difficult to um, establish where the, the failure is coming from. Now, the really good at uh, test houses will actually be able to tell almost by the nature of the sound spikes that they get in the in the results what the most likely causes of that sound failure can be now i remember one which was on an existing converted block of flats um, where the sound transmission path was actually through what was a blocked up uh, uh, chimney flow um so there was actually a sound path that was going through that so once they'd identified where that is then they, they can then go about 
quarter in the, the issue. The, the problem really is identifying where the failure is and it's where that leakage point is because a lot of the time, pretty much like the, the classic sort of, you've got a leaky pipe. Somewhere in the leaky pipe, the water is coming out, but you've got to identify where it is in order to be able to, to do that. And depending on where that is, it can be something relatively simple to do. Um, like, for example, maybe just uh, breaking the gap between the, the top of the floor and the skirting board. Um, that, that may be as, as simple as uh, is necessary. Um, or it may be that there's a problem in the, the connection between the joist and, say, the plasterboard layer uh, beneath. In which case, how are you going to get to the plasterboard layer that's below, that's causing the issue? Because that could well be in someone else's property anyhow. Um, so it, it may well be that there are simple solutions, but maybe that they're, they're quite complicated as well. So until you know the details of what's gone wrong, you can't come up with a solution. It's harder to, and it's hard to identify sound issues. Well, as Jeff said, it's subjective. So, and the thing is harder to identify, whereas if there's a leak, and it's a dry day, you can do a water hose test just to find out where the leak is, or you can do a CCTV, uh, you know, you can check things. Sound is a bit more objective, and that's why it's only really uh, required for housing, because that's where you leave. You shouldn't have a noisy person, whereas in commercial stuff you're working, it's not considered to be the same. So it's, uh, but yeah, look, it's hard to identify, and it's, it's hard to remediate. So back to back chasing, what can you do if they're done? Like it's, do you just like, mortar it over and do your chase beside it um sometimes it, it's a case of putting a new resilient layer over the top so sometimes it, it can be something like that that will will add to it but mm. none of these are particularly easy solutions um as, as, as you say if you've got two back-to-back -back sockets you know i mean you can bring them out um mm. put a, a noise pad between the, the two um but then you're physically moving them through obviously although we're not really talking about fire at the moment but the same thing applies there from a from a fire perspective that you can get fire spread through from one socket through the party wall to, to the other socket so those are the kind of things that you uh, it's it's all about good detailing and making sure particularly on the party lines you try and minimize any of those at, at, at all um one of the other things can be um sometimes they'll forget to um there's like a soil and vent pipe that runs between two or three of the uh, flats um sometimes that uh they use the wrong type of um you can, you can get an acoustic version of the uh, soil and vent pipe itself so the actual pipe is different and you can wrap it in uh insulative materials and obviously make sure the thing's boxed in uh, otherwise that's that's a classic example of where you can end up with a noise transmission because if if the noise hits that um physically so you get impact onto that that can end up transferring up and down the properties. So that could be, you know, sometimes it's things like the, the copper pipes, the gas pipes, any of these things can potentially be where it is that the sound's actually going through. So uh, yeah, always be wary of them. That's brilliant. Thanks a million for that today again, Jeff. And look, we look forward to our next installment onto part F and yeah. going through all the rest of the regulations. That was, that was super. Thanks yeah. a million.